Still in our website audit month, and I am so excited for today's episode because we've been talking a lot about how your website can perform for you and generate leads and help you get more visibility for your organization business. And there's some key things that a lot of people get wrong when it comes to their websites. And these are easy things that we can tweak and refine. So I'm really excited to have Danny McGregor on as my guest today to chat with you about the six mistakes that she sees people making on their websites so that you can get them fixed quickly. These aren't major things that are issues. These are minor things that you can take a look at, tweak and refine. So I'm excited for you to hear about these six things. Danny McGregor is a web and design creative with 13 plus years of experience with nonprofits. Her design experience ranges from startups, charities, and big national brands. Contracted to design for large brands like Forbes, and even hired by the famously fun Hard Rock, Danny utilizes her skills to deliver her clients more donations and more time back in changing the world. She is the owner, creative director, and digital strategist for the Charity Design Co., a design and tech agency helping nonprofits build exceptional websites and digital ecosystems that work for them. Specializing in building donor experiences, her websites help nonprofits attract more volunteers and donations and make bigger impact. I think you're going to really enjoy this conversation. And it doesn't matter what platform your website is built on, how fancy it is, or any of that. You're going to learn some ways that you can just put yourself above the competition. So I'm excited to hear what you think and which of these six takeaways she shares is the biggest impact for you. But before we get into it, this episode is brought to you by our digital marketing therapy sessions. Go to the firstclick.net forward slash office hours to book one-on-one time with us. We can take a look at your website, review these six elements that are mentioned here in this episode and chat about what we might need to do to get them fixed. They're super easy and you don't need a web developer to help you get them done, but we can definitely take a look and see what other ways we can up-level your website, get more visitors and get more conversions and donations. So again, the firstclick.net forward slash office hours. I can't work. Can't wait to work one-on-one with you. Let's get into the episode. You're listening to the Digital Marketing Therapy Podcast. I'm your host, Sammy Bedell Mulhern. Each month, we dive deep into a digital marketing or fundraising strategy that you can implement in your organization. Each week, you'll hear from guest experts, nonprofits, and myself on best practices, tips, and resources to help you raise more money online and reach your organizational goals. So we both agree that having a website that works for you is important, but it can't work for you if you're making some simple mistakes. So I love that you have come today with kind of six ways that you're in, your website might be hurting you because these are easy things to fix, but if you don't fix them, can be kind of critical issue. So let's talk through some of these so we can make sure that we're getting the most out of our website and make sure it's doing what it needs to do for us. So what's your first kind of way that your website might be hurting you? Yeah, absolutely. So my first big one is not having any visible impact on your website, right? So you need to have a way for donors, um, volunteers, even people coming and needing your services, your programs to be able to see where their money goes, what actionable things you do for them. And that can be in the form of stats that can be in the form of really um, testimonials, anything just put proof of what you're doing and put that impact up. Um, that is really a huge thing for many of our donors to come and see. Um, and yeah, you, you need to have that visible impact. So where should we be sharing that impact on our website? Great question. Um, one of my favorite places is actually having an R impact page. Um, it's kind of a a major thing that I like putting, um, on my clients' websites. Um, you can also kind of splice it in on your programs or your initiatives pages. Um, and you can also add them to your donor, um, your, your donation forms. If your donation embedded forms, or even on, say you're on a um, Bloomerang or a Network for Good where you outlink, a lot of them have impact statements that go for that dollar amount. So say $25 gives a, a backpack to a child or $50, you know, serves, I don't know, a 
a full year of elephant food. I don't know, <laughs> but you, <laughs> you, can, you can put something up. You can show that vision, that actual man, uh, monetary impact, and you mm-hmm. should place it everywhere you can. And that can really entice that donor to give a little bit extra. They're like, oh, you're right. You know, a hundred bucks versus yeah. 50. I can make that jump. Um, and getting them to get that to that click of the actual donate button or getting them to that donate page is splicing in that impact all throughout your website. Um, but a lot of times those more critical donors are going to look for an impact page. And that's also a really great place to put and um, encourage your partners to go to, your foundations to go to, um, if they're really looking for those tangible stats, in addition, obviously, to your annual reports that need to be on your website. So it's kind of like, how do we have little snippets of things that make sense that are relevant to the page that they're on to have, you know, that small showing of impact, but then driving people to that big page that has everything there for people that want to dive deeper and really take a, a, a bigger look. Yeah. At least that's my way to do it. I don't know if you agree. I'd love to no, hear I love your, that. Your- no, because I agree because I think like depending, like every page has a purpose. And so it's more about like, how can we make sure that people are getting the information they need for why they're there on that page? And then, right. you know, driving them using those buttons and those links and things to drive people that want to dive deeper to get the information that they want versus just like copy paste the same stuff in every single place and then hoping that it works. Right. Totally. Yeah. So we are in agreement there. Okay. So what is your number two uh, so thing to consider? My, yes. Uh, my number two is not having a secure website. So we all know um, if you've been on the internet enough now, you know, it's 2023. Um, the beginning of a URL is HTTP um, standard. And everybody really needs to have that secure encryption of the S. And um, that is just kind of standard practice now. And you would be surprised, as I'm sure you know, how many websites don't have that and how many browsers and um, personal devices are blocking websites that don't have that encryption. And um, yeah, you need to have an HTTPS encryption, 100%. Yeah, because search (laughs) engines will literally like drop your page in the rankings if you don't have that encryption set up. So how do people get that if they don't have it already? And or how do you know if you have it set up? Exactly. So um, our, obviously, you need to check in with your host, you need to check in with where you've purchased your domain. And a lot of times that's a quick, easy add on check with your web designer, your web uh, developer and see if they have added it. It's usually a very simple, easy um, 20, 30 bucks a year, not even I don't even know how much it is anymore. But it's usually pretty nominal. Um, And even some platforms like Squarespace and others that have a closed system with their servers offer it in in addition to the subscription purchase. So sometimes it's not even something you have to even consider an additional fee. Um, but builders like WordPress and stuff like that, you do need to consider that fee. Um, and so it's really um, something that you can check and see if you have it just by checking in with those people on your team, checking in with your services in general and see if you have it. But yeah, it'll affect, like you said, your ranking. It'll affect so many things. You need to have that. (laughs) Well, I'm sure you've all had this experience where you've gone to a website you thought was trustworthy. You know the organization. And all of a sudden you get that thing on Chrome that says, this website is not secure. Like, go back to safety, right? You don't want that happening to you when people are trying to go to your website. Right. It's like, it's kind of jarring and disorienting where you're like, I thought I was going somewhere safe. And, um, and they do it on purpose, obviously to keep us all safe. They don't want to have us adding adware and malware to our, what to our computers and devices. Um, and so obviously our do-gooders that are doing all these fantastic things, these causes who are doing great things on in the world, we know you're not doing poorly. So just add, add the secure, add, add the S. <laughs> I love yes. it. Well, and then the last point to this also is if you are taking donations on your website, that's also critically important to protecting the people's information that might be giving you their stuff through through your website. 
Absolutely. Yeah. If they're putting in their credit card, they're literally giving you free money. Um, <laughs> make it as secure and safe and um, nice for them to feel confident in your 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 organization. You've already done all the hard work. You've literally already done everything on your website to make it so they click donate. And if the one thing is that little lock in the in the URL box, like that yeah. you just lost the owner. Yep, so. 100%. Yep. Okay, so what is your number 3 tip? Uh, number three is a non-responsive website. Uh, so I'm sure you remember the days of a mobile version versus a desktop yeah. version. And there, <laughs> there were a few years where it was kind of um, all up in the air for whether or not it would be a mobile versus desktop world, or if it would be a responsive world, right? We didn't really know like how the tide would turn versus, you know, like a, a disc, uh, a mini disc versus CD, like how was technology, <laughs> how, was, how was society going to adapt? Um, and it responsive went out. And so if your website is not responsive, I think as of, what was it like 2018, 2019, um, Google docks you like significantly um, in ranking. Even if your site is SEO banging, you are docked um, because it's not responsive for devices. And it's just not a nice experience. Like UX, user experience is just poor. Um, So having a website, a template that is responsive is super paramount. Like I'm sure every designer, I'm sure every, you know, digital expert has been toting this for years, but I know I come across many websites that are still not. (laughs) Still not. Well, and I think like that, that's the nice thing I know about like Squarespace. A lot of those features are built in. If you're using a really popular theme, like we always use Divi, Elementor, like on WordPress, they have all of those features kind of built in. Um, but if we want to look at our website and kind of see how it shows up, do you have any tools or resources for where people can kind of view what that looks like on different devices? Absolutely. So it just depends on your builder. Um, and my favorite thing to do is kind of honestly just drag my window. And I, I use my devices. I ask friends to test too. Um, I grab my kids' iPads and see what things look like. Um, and I don't really have any like specific websites that can test it out, but each builder is different, right? Like Elementor mm-hmm. has some fantastic um, responsive tools where you can actually edit each individual screen size and, you know, remove elements for that, um, remove blocks for that set yeah. or, you know, tweak those elements for it. It makes it the mobile and different device experience completely um, new, uh, completely custom and bespoke to that, to that device, which is fantastic. And it makes it just beautiful. Um, and so you really just need to know what builder you're on. You need to know what platform you're on and you need to use those, um, responsive tools that they've already integrated to, Mm -hmm. to, to their extent, um, because they're there for a reason. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and I will say you can go down the rabbit hole because inevitably what will happen is you will have some person on your board or a volunteer who has some random device that the majority of people don't use and they'll come to you and they'll say, well, this looks terrible on my blah, blah, blah. And then you spiral and you go down this thing and you're like, oh my gosh, our website's terrible. It's not responsive. And Sammy and Danny told me my website needs to be responsive and you like flip out, right? So we always recommend that you look at your analytics because you can tell what device people are accessing your website on. So when that person comes to you and says, hey, it doesn't look good on my phone, you can say, well, we could go through a whole process and spend money on this particular device. But like 95% of our traffic comes from these types of devices. So like really use your analytics to determine the ways in which you kind of figure out which devices you need to be responsive for. That's my... Yeah, that's a really great point about analytics. I wasn't even tracking that. Um, yeah, no, I totally agree. I um, I usually am just super responsive to my clients. I'm like, yeah, no, it should be fine. Let's let's tweak. And so I, I like that idea to truly really just track it back to analytics because you do have that data. Why not? Yeah, great idea. Yeah. Sam. Well, especially as like you know, our um, developer works on a 4K screen 
So he'll send me stuff and I'm like, that is not what it looks like on my device. So, you know, responsiveness is important. I agree a hundred percent, but let's not like yeah. flip out about every single individual who says this doesn't oh, look yes. right. <laughs> well, okay. Well, yeah, no, I think like the user, the user aspect and user error, I do think that there is like that sense of urgency that a lot of clients or nonprofits come to because they do have somebody that is like, Oh my goodness, I couldn't get on or Oh my goodness, this did look poor. But as web does develop and as our nonprofits do start to morph more online and rely more digitally on these systems and tools, like there is an, a user element that can't be controlled, right? If you zoom in and out on your browser and it's set to, yes, you know, <laughs> 60%, it's going to look different than everybody else's that's set to 100. And there's nothing that any amazing, you know, savant of a developer can do to override that user element. And so kind of pulling back some of this and realizing that, okay, I can't control everything, but these six things you can control. Yeah. And will at least set you up for sir, for a better experience for your donors. Uh, yeah. That is such a good point. Such a good point. Okay. So we've gotten through the first three. What is number four? Yes. Um, so having um, transparency on your website, which is kind of tied into your um, vis- visual impact, but having transparency, authenticity on your website is in forms of your annual reports, um, your credibility as far as um, say you have a candid badge or anything like that, showing them how trustworthy your organization is. All of these things really just pull into trustworthiness, right? But that transparency element, have you provided your EIN number so they can go look you up online? Have you provided your status as a 501c3 or another nonprofit status? Um, Just being very forward with who you are, um, that transparency element is super important, um, especially to some of our more like tax benefit donors that are really just online looking for a way, finding a good cause and being like, I have this much money I need to get rid of before Mm -hmm. the end of the fiscal year, you know? Um, Just have that for your donors. um, And it also makes it look so it isn't so scammy. (laughs) Because unfortunately, there are some. (laughs) <laughs> to make it a bad name. No, I agree a hundred percent. But what would you say to organizations that are like, well, if we put everything out there, then some people are going to nitpick or they're going to look at stuff too closely, or they're going to say, well, we don't want to give to you because, um, you know, this percentage of funding is different than what we're looking for. Like, what would you say to people that, um, feel like that transparency might hurt them negatively in their opportunity to fundraise? Yeah, I can understand that. Um, I would just, though, make sure you have some nice PR blanket statements if that really does come up. But I can't imagine that there's really anything that you're trying to hide. Um, and if there is, clean up your house. Like, yep. take mm-hmm. care take care of your stuff. Um, because there shouldn't be anything for somebody to really come and find. And if there is, then maybe that you know, constructive criticism is an opportunity for you to grow. And if you really don't want somebody looking in at some of that information, yeah, you can leave it off, but you need to realize that could be donor money left on the table as well. Well, and also to that point, it's like in the time of recession or economic uncertainty, uh, we want to make sure that we're putting as much stuff out there for people to build trust with us. Cause it's going to be even harder to get those new donors uh, coming in the door. So it just helps with your overall professionalism in general. Totally. I totally agree. I really don't think there's any reason why a nonprofit shouldn't have that stuff up for transparency, but um, if you really are afraid of it, then, you know, maybe look at, some other issues. There might, there might be right. some bigger, bigger, there might be something else on. there. Yeah. So where yeah. might we want to put this information? Like where might we want to put our, um, rankings, like our, um, like, you know, if we have a guide star seal or where might we want to I said that really weird, where might we want to include some of these elements so that people can find them, uh, and, and 
they're trusted enough. Yeah, absolutely. I love putting these things in the footer because it's just a constant reminder of where you are and how awesome you are. Um, And so my two main things I always put in the footer is signing up for the newsletter and your transparency badges. Your EIN should go in your footer. Um, Your nonprofit status should go in your footer. Um, At least that's my opinion. I think you can just remind people constantly. Um, More and more, at least what I'm seeing, more and more your footer is kind of becoming your secondary main navigation. Um, The new kind of theme trend and, and web design right now is keeping that main navigation super clean and minimal and then just not fully dumping, but kind of dumping in the footer. Um, and so a lot of users are just straight up scrolling all the way to the bottom and trying to find what they want down there. So you're actually getting tons of great bounce rates um, for websites, which is awesome based on just users using that footer as a main navigation. Um, but with that, you're also getting more eyes on that section. So utilize more eyes on that section. Yep. That's a great pro tip right there. Um, I agree. Okay. So what is number five? Yes. <clears throat> okay. So number five, we are looking at just an outdated and disorganized website. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, it, it hurts. It hurts your donors. It hurts. It hurts everybody. If it is not, it doesn't have to be the most beautiful, eloquent, you know, gorgeous thing you've ever seen, but you definitely need to keep it organized and updated. If you have dates and things that are, you know, two, three years old, you look unprofessional. You look um, poorly organized. You look just not with it. And donors aren't going to want to give to something like that. So keeping things updated, keeping things without typos, keeping things current are incredibly important. Yeah. One of the biggest things that I see is um, people will have an event page and maybe they don't do that event anymore. But when you look on the event page, it'll show like, Hey, sponsors from 2019. And you're like, like, are they still around? Like what's happening here? Yes. 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 Like I usually try to encourage my nonprofits. Say you did have an event, give yourself a week to pull it off. But in that week needs to, that, that event needs to come off that, off the website. You can send your thank you email. You can do all those cleanup things, but that needs to all happen that week post. Like I'm sure you are exhausted. You are still handing out silent auction items. Your phone is still ringing off for people saying it was amazing, like fantastic. But the web maintenance, the digital maintenance needs to be a part of that checklist. Absolutely. Every single time, because it hurts. It really does hurt you. Um, These more Gen X, Gen Z donors who are actually coming up, this newer donor base, we are actually quite philanthropic and that's being seen, but we are looking for authenticity and we are being nitpicky because we grew up with technology. And with that, you are going to lose that donor base. And that is a fantastic donor base that you can be nurturing to be these larger planned gifts um, that these people want to be noticed. Um, So just, just take, take note, take care. (laughs) Um, I'm so glad you brought that up because that is something that we've been preaching with a lot of our clients because they're like, we don't need to market to Gen Z yet. Yes, you do. Um, But also something as simple as like changing out your header image or your graphic or like making sure that what's updated on when people first land on your website is showing new and refreshed. Like how important do you think that is to continue to be continually? Why can I not talk all of a sudden to continue to engage with people that are coming to your website. So they keep coming back. Yes. I love doing this with some of my clients who I get to work with on a regular basis. Um, I love updating imaging, um, and messaging and stuff like that. Whenever we can, we try to stick with, um, say it's your causes or similar, you know, parallel sort of month, say, you know, obviously February and Black History Month or um, April is month of the military child. It's also um, mental health awareness month. 
you tie those into your visuals online. You, those are easy updates. I mean, obviously as a designer, I love Adobe, but get on Canva. Canva is super cheap for nonprofits. And if you're on TechSoup, I believe they can even it's help free. you pay for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So like, there's no excuse. Um, upload your brand standards on Canva, upload your colors, upload your logos, and just up update your visuals. and. Um, keep those fresh because as soon as somebody logs on and they're like, Oh, that's new. Oh, that's fantastic. It shows that there's livety and breath and newness going on. And even if it's just regurgitated the same thing over and over, they don't need to know that it looks new, Yeah, but it, it shows them that you're, you're trying and it makes them just want to help you that much more. Um, yeah. We did a podcast episode about creating engaging headers, um, yeah. and I used some examples um, and recorded it. And my editor was like, "Do you want me to grab screen screenshots so we can use them for like the YouTube video?" I was like, "Yeah, that'd be awesome." Literally, I recorded the episode. He edited it two days later, and he's like, "That header's gone." I was like, "What?" <laughs> and I was mad <laughs> and so impressed at the same time because. Um, you know, they were clearly updating it based off of what their biggest priorities were in the moment. Um, And it was a national organization. But I think, yeah, we always say, just put a monthly reminder on your calendar, whether you change it every month or not, just to at least review it and make sure that it's current, right? Because that's also like the main thing that people are seeing every single Mm -hmm. time they hit your website. Like that's prime real estate. Yes. Yeah, I totally agree. And change your pop-ups too. Like- That is a great place to also just get people engaged. Um, Change them around different events that are happening. Change them around different um, donate options. If it's the holidays, change the visual for the holidays. Like (laughs) there are no, you need to be kind of following the calendar, following what's going on in your organization. And that just brings me back to making sure your platform works for you. You don't Mm -hmm. have to you don't have to get on to either one that you and I, you know, love get on one that works for you and that you are comfortable going in and updating. Updating is the most important. Yes. So yes, stay on it. Don't care who that. you're on. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think too, like you see Google does this. I mean, if you just start to pay attention when you go to Google, like over the holidays, there's a Santa hat on the G or like they have Christmas lights, like, you know, during black yeah. history month, they change their logo. And we're not suggesting that you have to like live up to Google standards because they probably have like 10 people on their team that are just responsible for like making sure the Google search page is doing what it's supposed to be doing visually. (laughs) Um, But it's just an example of something you can look at to your point, Danny, and and kind of get inspiration for what types of things um, might you do. Okay. So what is number six? And this is a, this is a biggie. This is the biggie. Um, You cannot make your donating hard. (laughs) And I'm sure, I mean, the amount of clicks and the amount of tolerance that people have for checkouts and stuff like that um, is just going down and then up. And it's it's kind of all <laughs> over the place. Um, I think everybody just kind of has digital fatigue <laughs> in general. Um, but making your donating hard, make it stupid simple. Once somebody has make, made that decision and that choice to donate and give you free money, don't make it difficult. So if your donor form is long, cumbersome, you know, five full page scrolls to get through <laughs> and you're asking them for their blood type and like, stop, like simplify it. If you really need to gather that information, maybe do it on a redirect later or, or something, but capture the money first and make it optional. Um, and yeah, like you, you can't make it hard. I don't know if you've run across any of those, oh, yeah. but it's painful. <laughs> well, and here's a thought. Weird. If you do need to get a lot of information from your donor or want that information, maybe just pick up the phone after they've donated it and call them and ask them some of those questions and engage with them and start a relationship. Yeah, I love that. It's like the blending of the two worlds, right? Right. (laughs) Sometimes we forget. Yeah, no, and I agree. And I think um, gone also are the days where you can, where you send people to a PayPal page. Like, there's so much technology out there. Integrations are so easy. Like you can't, that's no longer acceptable in my opinion. 
I totally agree. As as soon as I come across a client that's like, hey, can we can we include PayPal? I'm like, how about we try some mm. other options? <laughs> because that that doesn't work. PayPal is great for paying babysitters, you know, lawn workers, whatever, whatever. Venmo too. Fantastic. That is not the transparency, the authenticity, the professionalism your nonprofit deserves. Um, gone also are the days that Razor's Edge is the only donor management system that nonprofits can be on. Like there are so many fantastic tools and if you're on Razor's Edge, great, but there are so many other tools out there that are not costing, you know, seven figures. Yeah. Um, not seven figures, but you know my point. Like, it, yeah. <laughs> it, it, there are so many other options. And so you do not need to be using something that is not made for nonprofits, that is not made for charities or donor bases or volunteer bases. There, you can find a tool that will work for you and you need to use it. Yeah. Um. Yes. And we could go down that rabbit hole for hours for sure. Um, but what I love about like, okay, so I want to recap all six of these. Cause what I love about this is like, it's really, um, one of the, one of the pieces of advice that I got, um, when I was younger was dress for the job you want, not the job you have. And I feel like that's your approach to what you're saying here is like, no matter what size organization you are, where you're at, what your budget is, what you're growing is like, look for, like have your website look like who you are going to be when you grow up so that people have that trust and um, secure are secure with giving money to you, even if you don't feel like you're at that level yet. Yeah. And because you are ultimately like, no matter how many, no matter how baby you are, no matter how brand new you are, you are still doing good. Mm -hmm. And you deserve these six things to be not on your website because they're not hard. They're, they're, simple. And if you yep. do them, it, like you said, it's nurturing that donor base. Cause you, you do deserve them. You deserve to yep. not have them on your website and building up that donor base, building up that reputation with, within your community, within community partners, within people who are willing to give to you, it's making that a scalable option for you. It's a lot easier to add on bells and whistles or things like that, but these things can legitimately hurt your reputation in real mm-hmm. time, in real life, and yep. you can not fix them. So as soon as you get this kind of cleaned up and looking good, it's only moving and creating and growing. Um, but these things can really screw you up. <laughs> yep. They so. can. Okay. So let's walk through them again really quickly. So the first one is not having a visible impact on your website. Yes. The second is not having your HTTPS, your security set up. Your third is having an unresponsive website. Your fourth is not being transparent. Number five is outdated and disorganized. Um, and number six is making it hard for people to give you their money. If you, and I'm throwing this out there, putting you on the spot, if you were going to add a seventh bonus pro quick tip, what would that be as we wrap this up? I know there's a lot, but I would say not putting your board or like your staff on your website. Um, so obviously everybody has a different sort of like governance or how, how mm-hmm. you're organized, but if you do have a board set up, um, and how, how you are set up, putting those names, pictures, um, putting real faces and real community connections on your website, even if they're minimal, even if you mm. only have Two people <laughs> that have bought in to your cause and are volunteering and helping. Those are two names that somebody can get on and be like, Hey, I, I know Sammy or Hey, I know Tom and they're fantastic. You know, I go and play pickleball with them or I saw them at the restaurant the other day. Um, having that social connection is so important. Mm-hmm. Especially if you're a nonprofit. Um, and I, I would, I would say that would be huge if you do not have any names of people in your community that are connected on your nonprofit, on on your website to your nonprofit, you need to get those names on there. That's so good. That's building on that transparency and building that trustworthiness that you were talking about through this whole thread. So that's a great tip. I love that. 
Well, Danny, so many good things. I think you've got a quick checklist if you're listening to this to start knocking things off. And the beauty of it is nothing here is, well, depending on how outdated your website is. But other than that, nothing here is super crazy for you to take a look at. Um, so Danny, if people want to learn more about you or connect with you, how do they do that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can reach me at thecharitydesign.co or you can send me an email at danny at thecharitydesign.co. Yeah, and we'll link all of that up in the show notes at thefirstclick.net slash 196. Uh, Danny, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Sammy. It's so much fun to talk with you always. So what was your biggest takeaway? I think there are so many things that you can get done a lickety split from the list of six. And I hope that you start working on them today. Some of them might take a little bit longer, might require a little bit extra review from your team, but all are going to make a big impact on how your website performs. I hope that you will subscribe wherever you listened to this episode so that you don't miss out a single one and grab the show notes and resources at thefirstclick.net slash 196. For now, I am thankful that you take time to listen to these episodes and hope you're enjoying the month of websites. I'll see you in the next one.